So we talked about in-house movements, we've talked about outsourced and third-party movements like Salida and ETA, but what about some of the gray areas? Hi everyone and welcome to Saluso and yes today we are talking about one of the categories that fits into that gray area between an in-house movement and something like a Salida or an ETA which is a third party movement and that is modules. Now yes technically you can have an in-house module on top of an in-house movement but that in its entirety is in-house then and likewise you can buy something like an ETA 2824 which the base is an ETA 2892 and on top of it you've got a deployed across module but again that's entirely outsourced then what I want to talk about is that gray area that in between those hybrids we have half of the movement is in-house and the other half is outsourced and I'm going to be using two main examples the first one is the movement on the inside of the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak offshore which has an in-house movement for the time and date functions but uses a Dubois de Praz module on top to give it its chronograph. And then the other example, which is the Ulysse Nardin Marine Diver, which has an Ulysse Nardin manufacture module for the power reserve in small seconds, while on the bottom you have an ETA 2892 providing you with the time and date. And these essentially encompass the main combinations you can have. So why do companies bother with this whole module thing anyway? I mean, it's half and a half. You might as well go one way or the other, right? But there are a few advantages that come to both the consumer and the companies that make them that are inherent to modular movements. At the same time, there are also some very specific disadvantages as well. And obviously, because these are half and a half, there may be some overlap with their respective halves of in-house or third party respectively. So let's get right into the advantages first. And the first advantage is that it means companies can concentrate on their core strengths. Take the release now, for example. In the case of the marine diver, the module is the part that's made by Ulysse Nardin. It's the part that's more than just typical time and date. At the end of the day, you're not reinventing the wheel by making a movement that shows hours, minutes, and date. So why invest the time, the money, and the effort into creating something that's gonna essentially be on par with everything else in the market? You can buy it ready-made, it's good quality, it's reliable, has all the advantages that I listed in my video about third-party movements. What's the point? Instead, what they did is they concentrated on the part that is special about it, the part that is not necessarily gonna be common with every other watch on the market. That was the part where they show the power reserve and the small seconds. This is particularly important for Ulysse Nadan because it has that look of a marine chronometer, which is what their collections are inspired by. It harks back to their history. It's their way essentially of making this watch very much theirs without having to go all the way to do a full on in-house movement. Now currently they do a full on in-house movement, but you gotta remember that at the time, in-house movements weren't really all the rage, it wasn't really the way of doing business, whereas now it definitely is moving towards that, especially in the luxury sector. A great example as well is the original Tag Heuer Caliber 11, which competed with the Zenith El Primero as the first automatic chronograph. In that particular case, it was a collaboration between Heuer, Breitling, Dubois de Praz, Hamilton, Buren, they all brought their own core competencies to this design, which is how they managed to develop it so quickly and how they managed to do that without bankrupting them all respectively. Zenith in the aftermath of the El Primero, yeah, they may have gotten the credit for being first and they did it with an integrated automatic chronograph, which in the long term is more marketable, it sounds better, it is better by most watch purists perspective, but also it nearly bankrupted the company for decades. They had to shut down because of the exorbitant cost of development just to make that innovation. The second advantage is it allows for quick expansions and variations on a collection. Bringing it back to the Royal Oak chronograph, with that, what they've done is the opposite of Luis Nadan, where they have put all of their effort into making the base movement. The hours, minutes, and seconds, they've made sure they've decorated to Audemars Piguet standards because things like a chronograph are difficult to engineer. It's not a walk in the park. If you look at most companies, nearly all of them at some point have outsourced their chronograph and that's because despite the fact that it's a relatively common complication it's one of the most difficult to execute especially if you're executing it in-house if you look at a company like rolex they had to wait till 2000 to make their own in-house chronograph 
Patek Philippe was using a Lemania movement and still does in some of them until they ended up making their own one, I believe in 2006. But instead, what Audemars Piguet opted for is that they opted to play to their strengths. They played to their strengths of making the time and name part and making that as beautifully decorated as possible while outsourcing the chronograph module to an expert, which is of course Dubois de Praz, who are renowned for making modules. But the advantage to this is it also means that they can play around with this collection as much as they want. They remove that module and then they have a time and date version for the offshore diver. They switch that out for something like a chronograph and perpetual calendar combination. It allows them a lot of flexibility, the type of flexibility that you can't do with a fully integrated movement necessarily. They couldn't constantly be reinventing a full in-house chronograph, then a full in-house perpetual calendar, then a full in-house power reserve, dual time, etc. For that particular collection, it was much easier to simply go with a module that they could then switch out as per their needs. And then the last advantage is cost management. Again, this comes down to the fact if you're comparing it to fully developing an integrated movement in-house, that's a lot of money and that cost is always passed on to us as the consumers. So by the companies saving some money by concentrating on the part where they really want to invest to put the most of what that company is into the movement, it means that they can then pass on that little saving of what they've outsourced onto us as consumers. It's the same reason as to why you see the price point going up for a lot of these movements that have transitioned from being modular to them being fully in-house. So on the face of it, it looks pretty good. It shares a lot of the advantages, for example, that you would have with a third party movement. However, it is also hamstrung by some of the disadvantages of a third party movement as well, by having that external influence. So the first disadvantage is that it does affect the size of the movement, specifically the height. If you look at both the Ulysse Nadan and the Royal Oak Chronograph, both of them need cyclopses because by adding that module, you've now moved the sapphire and everything further away from the base movement which carries the date. So they have to have those little cyclopses, otherwise the date is going to look like it's down a tube, which effectively it is because the actual dial is much further away than it would be on an integrated movement. But this also carries on to the outside, especially to chronographs. If you look on a modular chronograph, you'll notice that the pushers are actually not on the same horizontal plane as the crown. And this just looks weird. And when you start getting into those higher end watches, that sort of asymmetry isn't a cute quirk. It just looks wrong. It looks odd. So that's something that's a disadvantage is that at the end of the day, much like with a third party movement, companies need to adapt their case shapes and their designs to the movement as opposed to being able to have free reign to create the best movement for the best watch and the best watch for the best movement for what their original vision is. There is that compromise. The second disadvantage, especially in the case of a modular chronograph, is it takes away from one of the best things about a chronograph, which is seeing everything that's there. You look at an integrated movement like on the Speedmaster Professional, for example, with the Sapphire Sandwich. You see this spaghetti bowl of different components, gears, plates, driving wheels, all of that is all mixed in and then that's everything that ends up getting finished. That obviously gets amplified when you start getting into things like high horology, like with the Tech Philippe chronographs. But at the end of the day, the beauty of most chronographs when they're integrated is you can see all of that componentry because there's so many more components there. With a modular chronograph, you see the base time and date movement, which is like any other time and date movement. It might be beautifully decorated, etc. But you don't see any of that magic because all of the chronograph components are all above that movement. So you don't see them unless you have something like an open work dial, like in perhaps the case of the Hublot Aerofusion. But for the most part, you miss out on all the fun, even if you have a display case back. And then the last disadvantage is servicing. At the end of the day, if you find someone who is servicing this external to the brand, they need to have skills in both servicing for that brand and servicing for that module. If you want to get someone external to service that release now done, they need to know an ETA 2892. That's pretty standard, but they also need to know how to manage it with that module. They need to have the movement holders and components. Sourcing all of that is as hard as it is for an in-house movement. And the same goes for the reverse. Take it to someone who happens to know about how to manage that Dubois de Prize module on top, but do they know how to service the Audemars Piguet movement on the bottom? Do they have the right components and tools to service that? Again, it adds complexity because now you have two different sources of parts, two different sources of knowledge are what you need when you're trying to get an external watchmaker to do it. Otherwise, you have to shell out the money for getting it serviced at an authorized dealer or authorized repair center, which means you're getting that disadvantage of a full in-house movement that you're probably going to be paying a lot more and you're limited in your options as to where you can service it. So as you can see, there are advantages and disadvantages to both. 
And again, like with most of these questions, a lot of it comes down to price and to the actual example that you're buying as to whether it's really worth it getting a modular movement or not. It comes down to also what the complication is on top, what different variants are there that you can get that maybe might be integrated instead of modular. You need to remember that modular doesn't always mean chronograph. You can have power reserves, world timers like on the 1858 Geosphere from Mont Blanc. You can get perpetual calendars. There's any number of different modules that are added to movements that can be sort of the deciding factor on whether you want to get it or not. Because in the case of a perpetual calendar, for example, it's much cheaper for a company to use, say, their own movement or a solid ETA or Salida movement with a perpetual calendar module on top instead of them developing the whole thing in-house. It's the reason why you don't see it very much except for in things like JLC, Audemars Piguet, Patek Philippe. So you do have to weigh it out and it really does depend on what your priorities are like in any of these movement discussions. But hopefully this has given you a bit more context as to how to approach this. I'd love to know your opinions in the comments below. What do you think of modular movements? What do you think is sort of the cutoff price? Or what do you think is the complication that you would be comfortable getting a modular movement versus getting a fully integrated movement? And what do you think about the idea of a modular movement being sort of a halfway between in-house and third party? I'd love to know your opinions in the comments below. And of course, if you like this video, make sure you like it and share it. If you want to see the full reviews of both the Audemars Piguet Royal Low Chronograph and the Ulysse Nardin Marine Diver that I featured throughout this video, you'll find links in the description below to watch them. And of course, if you want to see more pictures and infographics of watches that I feature throughout my videos, make sure you follow me on Instagram at Chaluso. And if you want to keep seeing new watch videos, make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell as well so you can know when my next video comes out. And last but not least, thanks for watching this video and we'll catch you on the next one.